I'd like to introduce Dr. Tracy Chippendale. She's our speaker today. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at the Graduate School here at Tufts. She received both her master's and PhD in occupational therapy from NYU, and before that, her bachelor's from Queen's University in Ontario. Um, she's also had many years of clinical, clinical experience working with older adults, and she teaches courses here at Tufts related to clinical reasoning, community practice, and aging. Um, her clinical and research interests are in geriatrics with an emphasis in aging in place, and her current research, about which she'll be talking to us today, examines the psychosocial benefits of autobiographical writing in older adults. Please join me in welcoming Tracy to the HNRCA. So, good afternoon. Um, the first study I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is a study that um, looks at the effects of life review through writing on depressive symptoms among older adults, um, which is actually the topic of my dissertation. Um, a little bit about my research, it really does have clinical origins in the sense that um, my research ideas really come from many years of practicing with older adults as an occupational therapist in an, a number of different clinical settings. And my experience was really that we were doing a decent job at meeting people's physical health needs, but less of a good job at addressing their mental health needs. And so that's what led me to my um, current research. So if we look at the prevalence of depressive symptoms among older adults, amongst community-dwelling elders, it's actually fairly low, um, ranging from 1% to 5%, but that's really for major depression. We want to think of depression as a continuum. Um, so people have mild depressive symptoms, uh, some have um, major depression, but in all cases we can see an impact on function. And we also know that depressive symptoms are more common amongst individuals who have functional impairments, um, who are living in supported housing, such as assisted living, where the rates can range up to 25 or 27 percent of the population with depressive symptoms. So we think a little bit about some risk factors for depressive symptoms uh, that make us concerned about some elders. So I mentioned some already, things like chronic illness, functional impairment, gender, um, but also income levels and levels of social support are risk factors as well. And especially as an OT, I'm very concerned about the consequences of mental health and depressive symptoms among elders. So we see people who do have depressive symptoms as having poor functional status, uh, lower self-rated health, and also um, poor rehabilitation outcomes um, and reduced social participation. What's also interesting is that if you look at pharmacological interventions for depressive symptoms, they are really not, um, they only have really modest effects, particularly for elders who have late life onset of depression and also those who have mild depressive symptoms. For, so for that subpopulation, they're really, um, those pharmacological interventions really aren't um, as effective. So it really opens the door for wanting to do non-pharmacological interventions. So the non-pharmacological uh, non interventions that have uh, mounting empirical support are things like cognitive behavioral strategies, um, as well as problem-solving therapy, um, also life review and reminiscence, which is um, really where my interests lie. And I wanted to just distinguish the difference between reminiscence and life review. People sometimes use them interchangeably, and there actually is a difference. So uh, reminiscence is really... Um, the act of, or process of recalling the past, you can do it through the, uh, silently, through the spoken word, um, spontaneously, or in a structured format. But an example would be sort of talking about one life event that happened in the past, so sort of a one-shot deal in some cases. Life review is really more a systematic process of um, reflecting, first of all, looking at your life as a whole from childhood to present day, and then reflecting back on your life as a whole. So it's really a systematic process. Um, and much more intense. And in fact, we really want to distinguish between the two also because if you look at the research, the effect sizes are very different for reminiscence versus life review. And life review is, has a much stronger effect with regards to um, depressive symptoms. So in my first study I'm, I'm talking about today, um, the hypothesis that I looked to investigate was that a structured life review through writing decreases depressive symptoms in older adults residing in senior residences. And the inclusion criteria that I used, um, I really focused on elders 65 years of age or older. I um, targeted people who can speak and write in English. 
Um, and I also ruled out people with probable dementia using the MINICOG. And the reason for that is so you think about the intervention, it relies heavily on memory. And in order for people to engage fully, I wanted to make sure that they um, had adequate um, uh, memory to do so. And then I recruited individuals. It was a multi-site multi study um, in four senior residences in the New York City area. And the method I used in this study was a randomized control trial. And I actually used um, randomization with force equal sample size. And the reason I did that was within each site, I recruited a small number of participants, so 12 or 13 individuals within each of the four sites. So therefore, I wanted to sort of equalize the numbers to make sure I didn't have um, you know, too large of a treatment group versus the weightless control group. And I, um, I used a baseline questionnaire primarily to establish that the two groups were equal at the start, the treatment and the control group. So I looked at things like age and ethnicity, um, number of activities of daily living, and instrumental activities of daily living requiring assistance. Um, looked at people who were concurrently taking medication for depression. Uh, and I measured social support um, using a few Likert style questions. And also looked at leisure participation. Since these are all related to depression, these are things I wanted to look at um, from the start. And my primary outcome measure and the, the results I'm going to discuss today are based on um, the GDS, which people may or may not be familiar with, the geriatric depression scale, the 30 item version. So this is a reliable, valid, um, screening tool specifically designed to be used with older adults in terms of looking at depressive symptoms. And um, just for people who don't know uh, a little bit about GDS, it has different categories. So from 0 to 9, this, you know, uh, looking at the score from 0 to 30, if you score the 0 to 9 range, it's really considered normal. Um, 10 to 18 is considered, uh, some is considered to have mild depressive symptoms. And then over 18 is considered to be severely depressed. So my recruitment, I recruited four sites uh, initially in the New York City area. Um, they were not, primarily they were assisted living facilities, but not all met the criteria to be an assisted living. So some of them provided their more senior residences in the sense that they had um, some supported services, meals provided, some levels of assistance with things like housekeeping, linen service, but didn't quite meet the criteria for assisted living. But all of them provided some level of um, IEDL assistance. And then within each site, I recruited using a variety of strategies. Um, depending on the site, I used um, flyers, I used um, scheduled information sessions, I presented my idea to the residence council, um, so really to get the participants on board um, and the residents at each site. And then um, following recruitment, I went through the informed consent process. People were randomized to the treatment or waitlist control group. I then administered the GDS um, and the baseline questionnaire. I um, administered the intervention, which I'll describe in more detail in a minute, and then did um, the GDS again, post-test questionnaires. And I also collected information on contamination. So within each site, you can see that um, you know, the control and the treatment group are in close proximity. They're living in the same residence. There was concern that there would be contamination, that people would start writing and telling stories about their life before um, you know, the implementation of the a weightless control group, but in fact that didn't occur. But that's other information that I collected um, at the end of the eight-week wor uh, writing workshop. So a little bit about the intervention itself. Um, this is a manualized intervention that was created by uh, Michelle Ciarpina, who's a gerontologist at Uni University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, and it's called the Share Your Life Story Workshop. It's a writing workshop um, that really focuses on teaching seniors writing skills. They can take with them and continue to use. It meets once a week for eight weeks, and each session is about 90 minutes in length. And what goes on in each session is uh, the group leader uh, introduces some writing tips, initially things like how to write tight, how to use active voice, um, descriptive writing. Uh, and then writing prompts are given each week that correspond to a different decade of life. So the writing prompts um, go decade by decade, the first week covering the ages of 8, 9, or 10, um, subsequent week covering uh, the ages of 18, 19, 20. Um, and so these writing prompts really focused on life events at that particular stage of life. Within each session, we also have timed writing exercises, so elders have the ability to, to write during the actual session. Um, and also the opportunity to read their work aloud and receive positive feedback um, from both the group leader and other um, participants. And also at the end, uh, which is an important piece for, for life reviews, there's an integrative component. So in the last session, people have the opportunity to reflect back on their lives as a whole and really um, look at how their life experiences have shaped who they are and to write about that as well. 
So a little bit about the results. I, I had a little bit of attrition. I was able to recruit across four sites, uh, 47 participants, and two were lost to attrition. So I ended up with 45 participants in total. A little bit about um, the participants themselves. Um, you can see the mean age, primarily women, pri primarily Caucasian participants, but I had different um, ethnic and cultural groups represented as well. So I had a subgroup of individuals who were Asian, who were Hispanic, who were African American. Um, and then amongst the total sample, I had just over 30% actually met the criteria for mild depression. Um, and uh, just under 30% reported they were concurrently taking medication for depression. And I also looked um, a little bit at, um, later in a dose response analysis, looking at the number of sessions people attended. So the participation ranged anywhere from three to eight of the sessions, with the majority of people um, attending five or more. And also, I did my analysis to make sure that, as I mentioned, the treatment and the control groups were not different from the get-go. So I looked, um, used chi-square tests of independence, paired samples t-test to make sure that the groups were equivalent. They were, in fact, with the exception of age. So the treatment group actually was a little bit older, on average, than those in the weightless control group. Um, and if you look at the change scores um, for the treatment group, 2.7 uh, versus 0.32 for the control group, and if you look statistically, there was a statistical dif uh, difference um, between the treatment and the control group, specifically using um, repeated measures analysis of variance. You can see that there's overall, uh, there was a difference over time between the pre-test you know, pre and post-test, but that, that was really dependent upon uh, group. The other thing I did is I wanted to just look not just at the statistical significance, but the clinical significance as well. So, um, I did a cross-tabs analysis to look at movement in GDS categories. So if you look, um, on the top is the treatment group, and really there was only movement within the treatment group um, between categories of GDS. So I mentioned already 0 to 9 is normal, 10 to 19 is considered uh, people have mild depression, and, and 20 and higher is people have severe depression. So you can see that there was movement. There was an increase in the number of people who fit that criteria of being normal with regards to the GDS. And then... Um, you know, fewer with mild depression and severe depression as a result. And despite the concerns of my dissertation committee, contamination did not occur. Um, so in the end, I didn't really have that as, as being an issue, even though people were in close, close proximity within, the, um, within each site. And if you look a little bit at the effect size, um, Cohen's D is 0.7, so it's approaching large in terms of the, the effects. And I did do a dose response analysis to look at, was there really a trend that the more sessions you attended really resulted in uh, more improvement in depressive symptoms? And the general trend was yes, that the more sessions you attended, the better you, you fared, but um, it wasn't an entirely linear year either. So I think what's interesting to me, in addition to sort of the quantitative findings, was the participants' feedback um, based on participating in the, in the workshop. So um, I had comments like, this is good for the mind and the soul. Um, you know, can you continue to run the intervention? Can you continue to run the group? I'm, you know, really enjoying this. Um, it was also interesting, there was a subgroup of participants who were highly educated, so re um, retired MDs, retired university professors, who said that this is the only type of intervention or group-based activity that I'm participating at my, at currently in my residence, so it really appealed to a certain subset of people, too, who maybe um, uh, some of the other activities that were uh, on site weren't as appealing. And I think what surprised me also was, um, and which led to my future work, is the impact that the, running this intervention had on me. So I've been working with older adults for 18 years um, as a clinician, and yet having that opportunity to hear life story from 45 individuals um, had a huge impact on my life. So I felt inspired, I felt uplifted, um, I had a history lesson um, from the participants, and so I really want to look at that in a more meaningful way too going forward. Uh, really understanding how it impacts people who have the opportunity to hear those, those life stories. So this is really consistent with existing literature, looking at life review, um, specifically life review through writing, and this is sort of consistent with findings in the past and other randomized control trials that it is an effective intervention uh, for addressing depressive symptoms among elders. Um, obviously there's limitations in my study. I, I both ran the intervention in all four sites, the treatment and waitlist control group, and I also did all the data collection myself. So, um, you know, at the time, um, you know, that, that could be considered um, an issue with regards to bias. I had a bit of a, you know, you could also see, think of it as being a clustering effect within each site, uh, using four different sites. Um, 
and also I didn't really look at long-term effects. So when I did my post-test, it was within a relatively short period of time after the end of the, of the workshop. But based on my findings and more the anecdotal findings of the impact that leading these groups had on me, um, I took the intervention and I developed an enhanced version of it, which I renamed Living Legends um, Intervention, and I did a feasibility study for this enhanced version of the intervention um, this past summer. And we've already talked a little bit about prevalence of depressive symptoms, particularly those uh, living in senior residences being higher. The other issue that we face is there's really a shortage of geriatric healthcare providers. So there's just not a lot of strong interest in um, specializing in working with elders. And so that was uh, some other information that I took in and helped me to move forward with my, um, my research. And we know that there's therapeutic benefits of life review through writing. Um, including my own study and the work of others, but also intergenerational programs have been shown to be very um, beneficial for elders. So um, intergenerational programs really, you know, programs that engage different generations in mutually beneficial planned activities. So it could be anything um, from participating, jointly participating in leisure activities or uh, attending university uh, programs um, together or older adult-led recreational programs. So there's all kinds of different variations of intergenerational programs, but if you look um, at the evidence and the research based on these types of studies, you see results like um, lower, um, stereotype, lower stereotype perceptions of themselves and students is one benefit to seniors, uh, improved depressive symptoms as well, um, and broader social networks on the part of seniors. And then for students who participate, some of the benefits have included um, changed perception of aging in older adults, and even amongst younger children, improve school, school performance. So there's a lot of positive benefits on both sides. So that's um, another important point. And then recently I've looked at existing data, um, some existing data to look at this, um, this variable and this, this um, idea of feeling valued and important. So I did some, I ran a couple of um, regression studies, which I've since published, that really looked at this idea of feeling valued and important as an important predictor of both life satisfaction and depressive symptoms among elders. So even in a, in a regression equation where I included well-established predictors like self-rated health and education, um, feeling valued and important came out as being a very strong um, positive predictor of, um, sorry, negative predictor of depressive symptoms. So that also led me to uh, my, um, my future work. And so this study that I'm going to describe now, really it was a feasibility study where I took the intervention of life review and I added an intergenerational piece where elders had the opportunity to share their written work with students uh, who were planning to go into the health sciences. So really it was a feasibility study in the sense that I really wanted to try to ascertain what is the feasibility of recruiting students who are pre-med, applying to medical school, applying to allied health professions. Um, so that was really a big part of the study. And then the other piece was really to try to refine the intergenerational protocol. So I was interested, um, I developed the protocol, I wanted to refine it based on um, participant feedback. So that was the other purpose of this study. And also I started to look just at the preliminary results using descriptive analysis. So in this study, what I was really interested in looking at with the preliminary results um, was what are the effects of this intergenerational exchange on image of aging among the student participants? And also, um, what are the effects of an enhanced version of this writing workshop as compared to the original protocol on depressive symptoms among elders. So you're know, looking at, does it have enhanced benefit to not just write about your life, but then to share it um, with others in a meaningful way. And then I also look qualitatively at what is the experience of students who've participated in an intergenerational exchange based on autobiographical writing. So inclusion criteria were similar um, to my last study with regards to the seniors. So I looked at people 65 over and over who could speak and write in English, and again, screened out for probable dementia. Students specifically, I was interested in 18 years of, um, you know, those who were 18 years of age and older, and who really were planning a career in the health sciences. So I specifically recruited that student group. Um, and this was, I mentioned a feasibility study. It was a mixed method study. It was a um, pre-test, double post-test design with a connected qualitative component. And so I collected uh, data at three points in time, at T1, which was at pre-test before the eight-week writing workshop, at T2, um, you know, the first post-test following the writing workshop itself, and then at T3, which was following the intergenerational program. And my outcomes were um, the geriatric depression scale, which I've already described. I also collected uh, written feedback um, from the seniors about their experiences in the intergenerational um, exchange experience. 
And then amongst students, I collected data using um, a tool called the Image of Aging Scale, which is really, it's a, a tool um, that looks at positive, both positive, two subscales, so it looks at both positive and negative images um, and um, stereotypes of older adults. And then I also conducted um, semi-structured interviews with the students to sort of um, understand sort of the hows and whys of the, of the qu uh, quantitative findings. And so data analysis was really descriptive. Again, it's a very small feasibility study, um, primarily you know, to, to look at feasibility of the, of the protocol. But I looked descriptively using SPSS, and then I used Colazzi's ph phenomenological analysis method to look at the qualitative data. And then the other thing that I used was, which people may be less familiar with, is um, a program called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count Software. So it's a, basically it's a, a text analysis software program that um, is designed to calculate the degree to which people use certain categories of words um, by counting the number of terms based on a pre-programmed dictionary. So it's basically, it's a very efficient way to um, analyze data for things like um, positive emotions, negative emotions, um, cognitive processes, social processes. Um, so that's the other, um, and I basically was looking at um, the response of elders and, and trying to understand that and, and analyzing using um, what the people refer to as Luke. So I recruited, um, I recruited a, a site, a low-income senior housing site, which fell through a few weeks before the study was to begin. So then I recruited another site um, in the Boston area, and I, um, within that site, it was a little bit of a challenge. Um, a lot of the residents were non-English speakers, so I had to be careful with recruitment in order to um, be able to specifically target people who could communicate in English and, and participate in the program. Went through the informed consent process. I collected data baseline questionnaires um, from both students and seniors at T1, so before the program started. Um, and then, you know, did the pretest for seniors at that stage. I administered the life review writing workshop, which I've already described. And then at T2, I did the first post test with seniors, and at that point, did a pretest for students. Um, before they started the intergenerational type um, period of the, or um, part of the intervention. I then ran the intergenerational program and did follow it up with my, my second post test and qualitative interviews. And then the other important information that I collected was the feedback questionnaires. So getting an idea from students and from seniors um, how to improve upon the intergenerational protocol. So I've already described the light writing workshop. Um, I used the same protocol for in this particular study, but then I added to it the intergenerational piece. And um, so I'll describe that intervention in a little bit more detail. So what it was is it was a group intervention that included both um, students and seniors um, in a sort of discussion format. It met once a week for three weeks uh, and lasted each session of approximately 90 minutes. Um, it started off with, before the program began, I did a bit of student orientation, just about what the expectations were for participation in this um, discussion program. In the first session, we had self-introductions. People introduced themselves, talked about some of their leisure interests, sort of as a, as a bit of an icebreaker. Um, and then what happened was, each week, each senior had the opportunity to select one piece of their writing from the preceding eight-week workshop and read it aloud. And then we had a... Um, I led a discussion based on the content of their writing. So types of questions I used to, to facilitate that discussion were things like, um, what are your reactions to the reading? Um, did you learn anything new? Can you identify with the story in any way to get people to share some of their related experiences? Um, so that's a little bit about the intervention. And looking at the results, again, feasibility of this study of a larger scale version of this going forward, um, it was actually, the method that I used to recruit students was effective. I did an email blast. I specifically targeted um, post back students at Tufts. So these are students who are doing their prerequisites in order to apply to either an allied health profession, medical school, or uh, for the, a PA program. And so I did an email blast followed up with an information session where I described the study, um, some of the needs of the senior population, and did a little bit of an information session as well. That was effective. Um, my only error was that I didn't realize that there was a, a science review session scheduled at the same time as my information session. So uh, I had a little competition for coming to my uh, information session, but in the end, um, everyone who showed up actually agreed to participate in the study, and some of the rationale that they gave was that they're building their resume with volunteer experience to apply to, um, you know, for further studies. And also they viewed it as a really great opportunity to work on their communication skills with elders. So that was the other sort of motivating factor for signing on to the study. Um, 
And then in terms of refinement of the intergenerational exchange based on participant feedback, you know, the majority of people felt they wanted more sessions, that three was not enough. So that um, was very valuable information. Um, seniors felt that they wanted to hear more from students about their related experiences. So, you know, we did have some of that um, as part of the discussion, but seniors wanted more back from, from the students about some of their own life experiences. Um, also, some other things. Um, I, I found in my experience that um, students um, struggled a little bit to communicate with people who have hearing loss, and some of the participants did have some hearing loss, so going forward that's going to be part of the orientation protocol, is giving people that sort of background information. Um, and then also, um, it was interesting that I got to hear what the, how the hearing life story really benefited see, um, students through their, um, through their um, the interviews that I did, the qualitative interviews, but seniors never had the opportunity to hear that. So I've also added to the protocol the opportunity for students to write about how hearing life stories have had an impact on their life and then sharing that orally with the, with the seniors as well. So that was another modification I made based on feedback. Um, and actually in the end, because of attrition, I had equal numbers of students and seniors within that intergenerational exchange and that actually worked very nicely. It was a very balanced um, session as a result. So the, those numbers work well. Uh, in terms of attrition, um, I started off with 10 individuals interested, 8 actually signed up. This is amongst the seniors participants. 8 signed up. Um, I lost 2 in the first week because of medical reasons. And so I ended up with 6 elders and 5 students um, in this uh, feasibility study. Um, and I saw improvement um, in the GDS scores from T1 to T2, meaning from, uh, you know, from baseline to um, you know, following the, the writing workshop. Um, there was no incremental improvement from T2 to T3. Um, however, as I mentioned, a larger dose may be needed, um, more sessions, and a more sort of um, equal exchange between the generations. This is just, I look, again, descriptively, it's very small numbers. Um, it's a feasibility study, but for the overall sample, you have sort of a, a medium effect. Um, for participants who actually had higher levels of um, uh, GDS scores, we see a, a large effect. And the results of the linguistic inquiry and word count software um, analysis was interesting. There were six times more words, this is amongst the, the written feedback from seniors about their experiences in the program, there were six times more words indicating positive emotions than negative emotions, and a large uh, percentage of words indicating um, social processes and cognitive mechanisms. So just so you have an idea what that looks like. Um, so words indicating positive emotions would be things like pleasant, accept, glad, pleasure. Um, words indicating social processes would be things like gives, receives, role, relationship. And then cognitive mechanisms, uh, words indicating that in the Luke Dictionary would be things like solved, accept, ideas. Um, just so you have an idea of what sort of uh, these categories mean. Um, and then was, was more, was sort of a, um, was sort of resulted in rather large effect was actually the impact on students. Uh, to be able to in participate in this intergenerational program. So if you look at the two subscales, po positive image of aging and negative image of aging, um, there was actually a very large effect in terms of increasing positive images um, of aging and, and a, a medium to large effect for negative image of aging. And also if you look um, at the qualitative results, it's interesting, it really does help to explain sort of hows and whys of those sort of quantitative findings. So here's some of the themes that emerged from the interviews with students um, with regard to their experiences in the program. So one of the themes was it was an enjoyable experience, and some of the quotes that people um, had to sort of substantiate this would be things like, people use words like interesting, enlightening, and fascinating to describe their experiences in the program. Um, another theme was that it provided insights into themselves and their own lives. And so one student said, it forced me to look at my own um, conceptions and stereotypes. And other students um, reflected on how it um, got them to reflect on their own communication style. The next theme was uh, exposure to life experiences that are different from one's own. So um, a quote to illustrate this was, the events that they lived through, namely World War II, communism, immigrating to the United States, are things that I never lived through. And another student stated, I definitely learned that being an immigrant must have been a difficult experience in this country. Um, another theme was um, uh, personalization of historical events. So one student stated, that trajectory of her life as a refugee was very interesting, and I've never heard what that journey was really like. 
and another student stated, it gave me a weird picture of a war-torn area that I didn't have before. Um, and really, amongst the students, it really, um, another theme that emerged was that it really changed their perception of elders, and specifically elders who live in, in supported housing, like assisted living and senior residences. And so some of the uh, quotes to, um, to illustrate this point was, I wasn't expecting to see people who were as healthy or as vibrant as they were. And another student stated, it, re it re reinforced the idea that elderly people can still have that joy of life, that ability to create something and be creative and put their life stories into that creation. Um, and then finally, the final theme is that, um, you know, it really did, it did pique people's interest in working with, with seniors. And um, some quotes to illustrate that was, I always thought working with seniors would be depressing. If I was treating the health of people who are like these folks, it wouldn't be. It definitely changed the way I thought it would be to work with seniors in a medical capacity. And another student stated, it has piqued my interest because there's a lot of experiences to be mined. So just, um, again, some of the qualitative findings I think really helped to explain maybe uh, some of the strong quantitative findings as well. So really, again, um, being a feasibility study, it really helped me to refine um, the protocol for a larger scale study in terms of enhancing that um, that sort of intergenerational exchange, increasing input from um, students, increasing the number of sessions um, was an important modification. And having that sort of reciprocal piece where students reflect back on how hearing life story has impacted their lives. So that's uh, really what came out of this study. Um, and the preliminary results are very consistent with, with uh, existing literature. So the GDS and the the Luke findings um, are consistent with regards to intergenerational programs that incorporate some aspect of life review. Um, so other researchers have found things like um, similar results in terms of positive affect, um, positive mood among seniors who participate, and also for students, past findings have included things like increased altruism, uh, changes in age stereotypes, consistent with what I found as well, and then uh, cognitive and emotional learning. Um, clearly, there's lots of limitations. It was a small feasibility study. People, people self-selected self into the um, program. I was the only coder for the qualitative analysis. Um, but going forward, really, the next steps is to take this and, and um, study this, this intervention on a larger scale. So that's sort of where this is going. So that's it. Some references for my presentation. Thank you. were able to write in some way because that was really what I was focusing on. Um, life review can be done orally as well, but that was not the focus of my study. So people primarily hand wrote the material. I had some people who had vision loss, so I did some adaptations for them um, so that they can still participate, people with low vision. So some of them used their computers with enlarged font, so that worked for some people. So primarily handwritten, but yes, yeah, some people um, computer generated their, their responses as well. But is that something you have to consider for these larger studies, how they actually do it? Be, yeah, I haven't done that in the past, because uh, the majority of people did hand write, but um, it might have, yeah, it might have an effect. It's possible. So, good point. Sure. So, did any of your senior participants talk about continuing this practice yeah. after the study was over yeah. and that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. So the protocol that I use, which I didn't, I didn't describe this aspect of it, but part of um, the protocol is actually making a commitment to writing. So that's also done in some, in one of the final sessions, as people think about how can they take this and, and can continue, continue to write and continue to share with both friends and family, um, you know, in a meaningful way. So that's actually part of the protocol is to really encourage people to continue to write um, to sustain the, the benefits. Yeah. And perhaps to continue. Um, with the groups and share their work with each other. Yeah. Because that seems to be an important part of, part of it. it. Yeah, to be able to share with others. So um, I have, um, in my work going forward, I've really thought more and more about sustainability. So, you know, you come in and you run an intervention, then you leave. And so what I've done in the past is I've shared some of the materials with, with staff so they can continue to run programs on an ongoing basis. Um, but also, yeah, to help elders to make that commitment to, to continue to write and share on their own. So. Sustainable because there are other forms of therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy yeah. that you talked about, and this just seems like something that 
perpetuate on its own once people learn those skills. Thank you. Yeah. Did you adjust your results at all for the possible effect of just kind of being part of a group and something That's a really good question. So I, um, I did not look specifically at the group effect, but I did, um, if you look at past studies, not my own research, but you look at past studies, people have looked at this idea of is it, um, is it the social support, is it the interaction, um, or is it the life review? And so in past studies, they have been able to distinguish between the two, and life review still comes out on top. Um, as opposed to comparing it to an intervention that, that's not life review based but still involves some sort of social support and social interaction. Yeah. And then I guess my last question mm -hmm. is on the uh, that there are different categories of depressive symptoms. So vegetative symptoms kind of feeling lethargic, apathy, um, just not feeling a little fuzzy in the head, um, self evaluative. Um, negative evaluative feelings of I'm not a good person, I'm not a worthy person, and then kind of strict mood related ones such as, you know, feeling blue or feeling mm -hmm. sad. So have you looked at some item analysis of the GDS to see if there are specific types of symptoms that are that are addressed by this therapy? I have not, so I've not really done any kind of subgroup analysis, um, particularly since my sample sizes have been but they were power, it was sufficiently powered to detect a change. So I, I looked, you know, did power analysis before I did my larger scale study. But I've not really done sort of subgroup analysis, and mainly because of the sort of sample size doesn't really allow for that. But um, the other issue I think is that, um, you know, some of the participants met the criteria for actually severe depression, and that was really a challenge for me. Um, clinically to get people to come to the group. You mentioned some, some of the apathy and some of the other sort of loss of interest as being some symptoms. So that was really a challenge amongst those individuals as the encouragement needed to have them attend each week was, yeah. Did you exclude people who were on pharmacological? I did not. So I factored into the analysis looking at comparing the treatment and the control group, but I did not exclude those who are um, concurrently receiving medications for depression. But there was? There was, yeah. So about um, just under 30, uh, just under 30 percent were concurrently taking medication for depression. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so we will have our graduate students like post-doc lunch upstairs on the 94th as usual. We'll see you all there. Thank you.